Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well. This video is going to begin our series on Module 4A, which is a review and supplement for Chapter 4 of your textbook. And Chapter 4 of your textbook, as well as these um, videos, are going to talk about attention. So this video in particular is going to be concerned with simply defining what attention is from a uh, psychological science perspective. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So I think the easiest way to begin to understand um, sort of the cognitive and neural substrates of our attention system um, is to think about some common experiences that we've all had. So I'm sure at some point in elementary school, you guys can remember maybe trying to pay attention to your teacher, right? But eventually you start to daydream maybe about what you're going to have for lunch or the games that you're going to play at recess or maybe one of the other kids sitting around you starts to, you know, pull something interesting out of their backpack or what have you. And before you know it, your teacher is leaning over your desk and angrily telling you to pay attention, right? We've all heard that before uh, from teachers and maybe from parents and maybe significant others or whatever when they're trying to talk to us, you know, telling us to pay attention. Another common experience you guys might have had as students is you, you know, do your due diligence and uh, um, set aside some time to study or complete your reading for class and you open up your textbook or your notes or maybe an article that you're trying to read for class and you start to read it and you read it for maybe three or four minutes or maybe even as long as 10 minutes and then suddenly you realize that you have no idea what you've been reading, right? And the last example I want to share is maybe you've been at a party, right? And so you're attending a party with uh, three of your closest friends. And so you all show up at the party and it's a busy party and there's all sorts of people, you know, um, hanging around and talking. Um, together, so there's a lot of noise, a lot of conversation going on. Um, but you go over with your friends, maybe sit on the couch and start talking very animatedly about something that you're really interested in. So you're really engrossed in the conversation. Um, but all of a sudden, you hear uh, across the room somebody say your name, right? And all of a sudden, your attention is taken away from this conversation that you've been really focused on uh, to the other person speaking, right? So this is something referred to as the cocktail party effect, which is just the fact that our attention is peaked even when we're deeply engrossed in other conversations when we hear important information like our own name, right? And other kinds of information would probably pique our attention also. Um, for example, maybe hearing uh, the word Mercer, right? As a Mercer student, that would pique your attention. So anything that is self-relevant to us or important to us is going to um, transfer our attention from the conversation that we're engrossed in um, to uh, whoever the person uh, speaking about us uh, is. So all of these examples illustrate various aspects of attention that psychologists have studied, right? But before we get into uh, what cognitive psychology uh, can tell us about attention, we first have to define attention. And that's not really an easy task. So the first person to attempt to formally give a definition of attention uh, was William James, who was the first American psychologist. And in his, uh, in his text, Principles of Psychology, which is the first psychology textbook, um, when he writes about attention, he defines it as 
everyone knows what attention is, right? It is the taking possession by the mind in clear and vivid form of what seems several simultaneous possible objects or trains of thought. Focalization, concentration of consciousness are of its essence. It implies withdrawal from some things in order to deal effectively with others and is a condition which has a real opposite in the confused, dazed, scatterbrained state, right? So essentially what um, James' statement implies, right? James' statement implies that attention has a clear conscious element. We pay attention to something by choosing something in the environment to hold our current consciousness to the exclusion of other things in the environment, right? So this could mean focusing on the words of the text that you're reading and ignoring sounds in the background, such as background music. Um, you could also be ignoring other sights, right? So for example, if the surface of your book is lying um, uh, next to other things, such as your computer screen, you would ignore those things in your environment, right? Alternatively, though, uh, as you're reading, you might begin to think about your plans for that evening, um, so that even as you read, you find that you're focusing your attention on your thoughts instead of what you're reading, right? So that implies that really what underlies attention is whatever we choose to put the spotlight of our consciousness on. Right? So the preceding example might have led you to conclude that everyone knows what attention is and that it's fairly easy to define but that's not necessarily true, right? So a, a more contemporary, very famous cognitive psychologist named Hal Pashler, who has done a lot of really interesting work looking at the cognitive neuroscience of attention, says that no one knows what attention is, and there may not even be an it out there to be known about, but of course there might be, right? So what this kind of humorous quote suggests um, is that there are lots of different potential definitions for attention, and it might not even refer to a singular mechanism, right? So there might be lots of different types of attention out there. And one of the reasons why we find it so difficult to define attention is that attention is involved in almost every aspect of all cognitive processes, right? So we can't have um, functioning perception of stimuli without attention. Um, as we saw with the modal model, we can't have uh, information get uh, processed serially through all of the different phases of, atten of memory without attention. Right, because if we don't pay attention to something or deem it to be important, then it never gets transferred from short term to long term memory. Um, we wouldn't have language or problem solving without attention, right? Because if we're not paying attention to the person we're speaking to or the things um, that are going on around us, then we can't clearly express ourselves um, and so on, right? So all mental computations are going to uh, necessitate some aspect of attention or some attentional mechanism. Right? But like I said, when, in order for us to effectively understand what attention is, it's difficult to arrive at a singular definition. So instead, psychologists have distinguished between multiple types of attention. So the first type of attention uh, that psychologists have studied is selective attention. So selective attention is just the ability to perceive a particular stimulus while simultaneously filtering out or ignoring other stimuli, right? 
So maybe a classic example of selective attention that you guys can all relate to is if you're trying to study at a busy coffee shop, right? So you have your book or your notes in front of you and maybe you're making flashcards or, or going over the material, right? And while that's happening, while you're shining your spotlight of attention on that information and trying to hold that into consciousness, you're simultaneously going to ignore, for example, the sounds of the, you know, espresso machines and all of the coffee making equipment. Maybe you're going to ignore uh, the barista who's calling out people's orders um, and it, and one of the biggest things you're going to have to filter out is all of the other conversations going on around you uh, in the coffee shop as well, right? So a coffee shop is actually a fairly noisy environment. So you have to preferentially focus on the information you're trying to study while filtering out um, pretty much everything else in your environment, right? So that's selective attention, is the ability to preferentially focus on whatever your target is in that case it's in this case it's um, the information you're trying to study while filtering out all of the other irrelevant information next we have divided attention right and just like it sounds right divided attention uh, occurs whenever you have two or more stimuli that you're going to try to pay attention to simultaneously, right? And the critical feature of divided attention is these two or more stimuli that you're trying to attend to simultaneously are going to share the same pool of cognitive resources, right? So what that means is that in effect, whenever you're doing two tasks at the same time, your performance on either task is going to be worse than if you were working on a single task, right? So kind of the classic example of divided attention um, that's very relevant in the current day and age is people who are driving while simultaneously talking on a cell phone or eating or drinking or putting on makeup, right? Or doing uh, any number of things, even listening to the radio, right? All of these tasks are happening, are happening concurrently, right? Um, and what a lot of data suggests, and we'll uh, talk about this in more detail in future lectures, but what a lot of data suggests is that your driving ability is significantly impeded when you use a cell phone while driving, um, even when that cell phone is a hands-free device, okay? Um, another maybe more innocuous example is walking around your house and doing spring cleaning while talking on the phone, right? Those might seem like uh, more tasks that, that you can divide your attention with um, or divide your attention between more successfully. Um, but it would be another example, um, because if you're, uh, for example, attending to the conversation, right, one would think that it would take you longer to clean your house than it would if you were working independently and not talking on the phone, right? So divided attention, you're doing two or more tasks simultaneously, each that necessitate attention and share the same cognitive resources which means your performance on either task is going to be worse than if you were performing that task alone. Okay, so the final uh, type of attention that we're gonna be talking about um, is one that you guys are actually more, um, that you guys are actually already familiar with. Um, and this is the executive attention. So it's very, very similar. And in fact, it's the same concept that we talked about when we talked about Badley's model of working memory, right? So one of the components of Badley's model of working memory is the central executive, right? 
So the central executive is responsible for uh, either focusing your attention on uh, the phonological loop or the visual spatial sketch pad or both simultaneously or what have you, right? So the central executive is the traffic cop that decides where your working memory should be focused, right? Um, so essentially, in terms of a formal definition, one of the most important things that executive attention does is it's going to be a conflict detector, right? So it's going to uh, suppress or prevent inappropriate responses in favor of appropriate ones, right? So you might think that this doesn't really make sense, right? Um, in terms of the working memory example I just gave, um, but in fact it does, it's the same process. So you might remember when we talked about the Stroop task, right? So the Stroop task is you're given an array very similar to this one, where you're asked to read the text in which the word is printed, right? So there's an obvious conflict there, right? Because the color, oh, that's Marley. Marley wants to say hi. You wanna say hi, Marley? Say hi. So now you're all going to have to try to suppress your attention on Marley in favor of, of listening to me in the lecture. So this is a real time in vivo example of, of uh, selective attention. Um, okay, so, so there's an obvious conflict here, right? Um, because the color denoted by the word is different than the color in which the word is printed, right? So in order to do this task successfully and read the, the color in which the word is printed, green, red, blue, etc., you have to suppress your uh, usual response of reading the word in favor of reading uh, the color or, or noticing the color in which the word is printed, right? So this is in essence what executive attention is. Like I said, it's selecting an appropriate response, okay, after suppressing or preventing an inappropriate response, right? So another classic example of executive attention um, is, Suppose that you're washing dishes at a kitchen sink, right? So on your kitchen sink, on your windowsill, you have a variety of succulents and other plants, including a cactus, right? So as you're washing the dishes, your hands are kind of, you know, flailing everywhere, kind of like mine are right now, um, and you knock over the cactus, right? So your usual response, your standard response, would be to reach out your hand and attempt to catch the cactus, right? But obviously that would be uh, an inappropriate response because then your hand would have all those little, you know, spears in it and it would be painful, right? So your executive attention is going to allow you to suppress your sort of, uh, your reflexive response of grabbing the plant in favor of letting it fall to the floor and break, right? So that's executive attention, right? So when I gave you the example of the traffic cop, I don't know if you guys remember, but uh, you were, uh, in this particular example, someone was driving in a car uh, and their friend was reading them directions to a restaurant and while they were driving in the car and trying to listen to the directions um, so that they could go to uh, a restaurant that they had never been to before, the radio was playing, right? So the central executive in that example is going to filter out the sounds of the radio playing, right? So again, that's, that's executive attention, right? So you're filtering out um, irrelevant attention or irrelevant information in favor of relevant information.
okay? Or you're selecting an appropriate response uh, and deselecting or uh, ignoring uh, an inappropriate response, okay? Okay, so what we've covered so far is we've tried to define attention as best we can, although that's not always possible, right? There's, um, and that's because there's many different types of attention. So we've talked about selective attention, we've talked about divided attention, and we've talked about executive attention. Okay? All right, so in this next lecture, we'll talk about how psychologists study attention or what uh, methods that they use. And we'll also talk about what theoretical mechanisms psychologists postulate are underlying attention, right? So how is attention sort of represented and executed in the mind? And also, what are the neural substrates of attention? Or what are, um, how is attention uh, sort of uh, created in, in the mind or, or in the brain, excuse me. Um, so what structures of the brain are responsible for, for example, selective attention, divided attention, and so forth. Okay, all right, so that concludes this lecture and I hope you guys are all doing well and I will see you in the next one.